Good evening, everybody, and a great big welcome to this, the second summer lecture by the Royal Philosophical Society. I'm Trisha Port, I'm one of the vice presidents of the institution. And tonight we have a talk on a new topic for the Royal Philosophical Society, the building of the Borders Railway. It's not a topic uh, we normally cover, but before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to give you some details as to how we are organising the meeting tonight. All being well, you will just hear two people speaking. That's myself, who's chairing the meeting, and our speaker, Hugh Ward. Now we have on the introductory slide, we did have um, a bit of information about putting forward questions, and that is using the small icon at the bottom of the screen, the Q and A icon. And that is where you should type in your question. Now, because when you're typing that obliterates part of the screen, we will have a short break after Hugh's talk so that you can type without being distracted from the talk. Also, you will see at the bottom of the screen the chat icon. And if you do have any technical difficulties, if you type your concern in there, one of our council members may be able to help solve that for you. So now to our meeting this evening, the building of the Borders Railway. And at 49 kilom kilometres long, this is the longest new domestic railway to have been built in Great Britain in the last 100 years. And our speaker tonight is Hugh Wark, a chartered civil engineer whose whole career was spent in the rail industry. And towards the end of his career, he was the project director for the Borders Railway for Network Rail. And he's going to tell us tonight about the building of this exciting and very successful project. Hugh. Well, uh, thank you very much, Trish. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you for the chance to talk to you about the Borders Railway. Um, it is a little bit old hat now as uh, the railway has been open for almost five years. Uh, however, I hope you enjoy this nonetheless. It's very much the story of the building of the railway and it's partly a chronological story about how through time we built the railway, but it's also a journey down the line from north to south um, as we did start the build at the north end of the route um, albeit later on in the, in the process of building the line, we were working uh, all along the line at, at various stages um, at the one time. However, no story about the Borders Railway would be complete uh, without looking back to the closure of the original line. So this is uh, 6th of January, actually the 5th of January, 1969. And uh, the top pictures show Hoyk Station with the protesters out, including uh, a, a coffin being sent to the Minister of Transport um, as, they, as they protested against the closure of the line. And that culminated in the lower picture with a fairly famous incident at Newcastleton level crossing, uh, where the villagers come out um, after midnight and stopped the overnight sleeper train, the last train in the line, and uh, police reinforcements were called, and they had to call out the very young David Steele MP uh, to try and placate the uh, the local the local uh, villagers. Now the Waverley Line was the the main route between Edinburgh and Carlisle. Um, it was a main through route, and in the 1950s, there was quite a significant network of lines, branch lines and the borders. But by the 1960s, most of these had been closed, and all that was left was the main uh, line through the borders, 
and the branch line to Langham was still open at that stage. Um, unfortunately, because it was seen as a, a through route, it was very easy for Dr. Beeching when he came along to argue that um, the line could be closed and all the traffic could be diverted through Carstairs to the west, the, say, the, the way the trains go today, in fact, between Carlisle and Edinburgh. Um, however, it did uh, cause a lot of damage to Gala Shields and Hoyk, and it left these two places further from a mainline railway station than any similar sized town in the UK, further from a, a railway station, and it left the whole of the Scottish Borders uh, region without a station uh, within its boundary. Uh, the track was lifted eventually after a kind of heroic uh, preservation attempt to run it as a private line. Um, and very quickly, there started to be building works in various parts of the line, particularly road works. There was various road schemes to use bits of the railway formation. And so um, things kind of carried on like that. And things started to change around about the late 1990s. Uh, the campaign for Borders Rail had been arguing for the reinstatement of parts of the railway. And around about that time, there was some major industrial closures in the borders. And Scottish Borders Council, along with Midlothian Council and Edinburgh City Council, um, started looking at feasibilities to, to reopen sections of the line to spread the economic prosperity of the Edinburgh area down into the borders. Uh, they eventually put a, a, an act, a Waverley Railway Scotland Act, through the Scottish Parliament, which had a very pro-rail agenda at that time. The, the, the Act of Parliament was important because, uh, as well as giving the powers to build the railway, it gave the scheme outline planning permission and also, importantly, compulsory purchase uh, powers over, over the land because all the land... Uh, now lay in private hands. So the, line, the, the proposal that the Act of Parliament um, uh, suggested was uh, opening the northern third of the line, so 30 miles from um, just outside Edinburgh, all the way down to Gala Shields and Tweedbank. Now, it was a very geographical railway. It climbs steeply all the way from Edinburgh, um, twisting and turning, diverting round by Tynehead to try and gain height up to Fallow Hill Summit, which is the highest point in the line. And then the railway uh, follows the valley of the River Gala all the way down to Gala Shields, um, where it joins the Tweed. And it twists and turns, crossing, crisscrossing the River Gala uh, about 20 times or so on its way down to uh, Gala Shields and Tweedbank. The new stations are, are shown in black, and starting at the north end, uh, we have Shawfair. Now, Shawfair is a brand new development area in the southeast of Edinburgh. Uh, eventually, there's going to be thousands and thousands of new homes there. And there was a desire to bring the railway through the Shawfair area. So, actually, this northern section of the railway is in a brand new alignment. It's further west from the original alignment. Uh, to bring the railway through the Shawfair area and uh, allow a station to be built there. But it also gave an easier crossing of the Edinburgh City Bypass, which of course had been built in the intervening years and took no cognizance of the river being a railway here again. The next three stations at the north end of the line, S-Bank, Newton Grange and Gorebridge, all had stations in the original line. And then the next station right down in the borders is at Stow. Now, Stow originally was not to get a station. It was deemed to be too small. But the good people of Stow put up a, 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 a strong fight uh, with the parliamentarians at that time. And uh, it was eventually agreed that they could have their station. Uh, Gala Shields is the main station in the line. Um, and as you'll see later, uh, there wasn't much room at Gala Shields to put a station. Uh, so it's the only station that doesn't actually have a car park. Tweed Bank at the south end of the line is the terminus. Now, why, why stop the line at Tweed Bank? Um, especially as we're, we're only a short distance from Melrose. Uh, the feasibility studies 
identified that this was really the optimum balance between cost and benefits. Um, Tweed Bank uh, allowed space to build a, a large or a station with a large car park. And there's also excellent road connections uh, to all the other major towns in the borders. Um, in red here, you see some of the key uh, construction challenges in the line. In the north, this is largely about roadworks and bridges. Um, in the central area of the route, we've got Fallow Hill Summit, um, where we had some major um, challenges in getting the interface between the A7, the railway, um, and the local community at Fallow Hill. And then at Heriot and Fountain Hall, we had two of the uh, level crossings on the original railway. And we don't like level crossings now in new railways. We, they, they are an inherent risk. And so there was fairly major roadworks required at Heriot and Fountain Hall um, to allow the railway to be, uh, to, to allow uh, the closure of level crossings. At the south end of the line, we have the two tunnels, Beauchamp Tunnel and Torwood Lee Tunnel, and we'll, we'll talk about them shortly. So seven new stations with car parking for six. Uh, it was designed to provide a 55 minute running time from Tweed Bank to Edinburgh Waverley. <clears throat> the idea is to have a half hourly passenger service during the day. Um, and it, indeed, it is a very good uh, train service. It starts very early in the morning and finishes very late at night. It's one of the last trains leaving Waverley at night. It's actually the one down to the borders. Um, Diesel trains, but with passive provision for future electrification and a signalling system controlled from Edinburgh Waverley. In terms of scope, that meant 42 new bridges, 95 refurbished bridges, two tunnels, one and a half million tonnes of earthworks. I'll say a bit more about that. And of course, all the track had to be laid, new drainage and fencing throughout the line. And interestingly, for, for a new railway, some 10 kilometres of new roads associated with it. Now, the first thing we had to deal with was mining remedi remediation. Uh, basically, the area north of Gore Bridge up to the edge of the Edinburgh area was uh, heavily undermined over the years. Um, not just like in this area, this is the area of the old Moncton Hall Colliery, a fairly modern pit uh, which had very deep, uh, deep shaft and deep seams. Uh, but a lot of the problems stemmed from ancient mine workings going back prior to the 18th century where there was very little record of them. Uh, and it left behind fractured and broken grounds, um, cavities and, and lots of um, un lots of mine shafts which weren't uh, uh, terribly well recorded, weren't recorded at all in some cases. At one stage we had all the, all the drilling rigs in Scotland on site uh, and it really was a, a major undertaking to try and tackle uh, this um, uh, mine working. Um, obviously running a, a passenger train service um, over areas of mine workings at uh, you know up to up to 80 miles an hour, we couldn't risk any possibility of a train being derailed because of because of settlement. <clears throat> now again, at the north end of the line, I, I mentioned the railway was diverted. Um, unfortunately, when they decided to divert it, they actually diverted it through a big hill. Um, so the very first thing we had to do was dig a huge cutting. Uh, through the hill at the north end of the line, which is mostly natural material, but there was also some uh, colliery spoil on top as well. Uh, luckily, we, uh, th there was a lot of excavation throughout this section of the line, and we did have space on some spare railway land in the area uh, where we could uh, spread and landscape uh, all the excavated material. Uh, this is further along the same section of new railway line and uh, hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen. Um, this is the section of brand new railway getting built uh, and um, some of these roads were the original roads in the area and uh, this is some of the new roads we're having to construct. This is all tied into other roads that were, other roadworks uh, taking place in the new Shawfair area. 
But one of the challenges we had, this uh, area here at the Cockatoo pub, this road here, the A6106, actually passed along the line of the railway in this area. And the road going off at the bottom right-hand corner here um, was a, a new road linking over to the A7 and um, Midlothian. It was developed by Midlothian Council. And the idea is that this would re this would replace this uh, road that we were hoping to close. Um, unfortunately, the last minute, Midlothian announced that they couldn't actually, they didn't actually have the powers to, to close this section of road. So we're left with no option but to rebuild it um, along to the west side of, of the new railway. And here you can see further along, this is again the new railway getting built. This is the new A6106 that we had to build um, virtually at the last minute. Uh, and we also had challenges with a, a major BT fiber optic cable going through uh, the land in this area, which uh, uh, was, was a fairly big challenge because some of these main fiber optic cables, uh, which feed the, the economy in the Edinburgh area, um, take a long time to negotiate uh, movement with, with BT. Uh, but further south in the railway, even in the original sections of line, there was major earthworks required. The railway over the years had been used as a dumping ground for spoil. Uh, bits of it had been infilled um, or had collapsed over the years. Um, and so we had major uh, earth moving work, major civil engineering work throughout uh, the northern section of the line and indeed over the whole line. One of the first big structural challenges we had was the Edinburgh City Bypass. Um, when the Borders Railway was, or the construction of it was announced uh, in 2011 uh, that we're actually starting work, there was headlines in the Edinburgh Evening Standard that the Borders Railway was going to cause traffic chaos in Edinburgh because we were going to close the Edinburgh City Bypass. Uh, well, needless to say, we were quite determined that that wouldn't happen. And we decided to um, build a diversionary route for the road. And you can see it starting to take place here. And the next few slides show uh, the temporary, temporary road diversion taking place. And you see the, the traffic's now been diverted onto the new road and we've started excavating uh, for a bridge. You can see the new sections of bridge being installed. Uh, this was all prefabricated concrete, so it was a fairly quick job to do. We're starting to backfill now, almost up to the surface. You can see the black top starting to go down. And here is the, the finished uh, bridge with the, the rails going through. And the road, <coughs> pardon me, has been diverted back onto its original alignment. Um, over the bridge. I have been asked in the past, why didn't we just build a permanent realignment of the road? And the simple answer is, uh, this land where we built the temporary diversion, we only had powers to use that on a temporary basis. And we had to reinstate this and hand it back to the landowner, which happened to be the Duke of Buccleu. Um, so um, we're pretty sure we did ask, but uh, there was no way that uh, we were going to be able to get that land. <clears throat> the next big challenge was Harden Green Roundabout. Um, again, a new section of the A7 had been built. This roundabout had been built in the end of intervening years. And uh, the railway used to cross right across the middle of where the roundabout is now. So we're left with no, ch no uh, option but to uh, build a bridge. And uh, we used these U-shaped concrete beams. These uh, came from Ireland. And um, they're over 100 tons each, if I recall correctly, uh, over 100 feet long. And they came in these special transporters. Um, unfortunately, in February 2014, when we were um, getting these beams installed, uh, there was a major weather uh, event in the UK at that time, if you can remember. Uh, all the ferries were disrupted and uh, the police were busy with emergencies. And it was touch and go whether we're going to get these beams um, onto site in time for the installation. However, they arrived. Uh, we had a, a fairly extensive road closure on the A7 to allow us to install the beams. Um, and the next sequence shows, uh, shows some of the beams being installed. We had a, <clears throat> a, a 1,000 tonne 
road mobile crane. I, I love this bit. This is just like Thunderbirds. Those of you who remember Thunderbirds. Um, so this, this is uh, one of the largest road mobile cranes in the UK. Um, and it required various other cranes to uh, put it together overnight in the Friday night. Uh, this crane is just the baby crane that does the building. Um, so it's starting to get it together. That's the big crane. That's the thousand ton road mobile. Now here's the beams coming in just after dawn in the Saturday morning. <clears throat> Takes a bit of uh, organization and rigging to lift these into place. I always wish we could actually get people on site to work as fast as uh, what you see in this time sequence, but it never seems to happen that way. So that's two beams in. You can see the weather brightened up. We're actually very lucky with uh, the weather throughout the build of the Borders Railway. We didn't have too many weather problems unlike some other projects that have been on. So in the Saturday night, the final of the four beams were lifted in. Um, Sunday we spent putting a, a deck on uh, and over time the ends were uh, filled in as well. And uh, a few months later we had the first train, one of our track construction trains, uh, passing over the bridge. But further south from um, Harden Green, we come to New Battle Viaduct, a beautiful 23 arch masonry viaduct which dates from the opening of the line in the 1840s. And it was really in remarkably good condition. We're quite concerned about this structure. Um, it, it really is uh, one of the icons of uh, the old Waverley Line and the Borders Railway, but it was in remarkably good condition. And one of the reasons for that was that at some time in the past, possibly during the 1950s, a new concrete deck was installed uh, with new upstands either side. And that protected the viaduct and stopped the water uh, percolating the deck and into the, uh, into the spandrel walls uh, and arches. Um, water's always the, the, the enemy of an engineer. And um, if you can prevent water ingress, then it does prevent a lot of damage. As we move south from uh, the built up areas into um, beyond Gore Bridge, this is what faced us. The, the railway had been returned to nature. Um, farmers used various parts of the line. And uh, the earthworks, particularly around the Tynehead area, were in very poor condition. Um, this was a railway built on a fairly grand scale for its day. You can see the height of uh, the cutting slope here. Uh, but they were in poor condition, required a lot of remedial work. The whole area through Tynehead um, was very prone to slips and um, you can see the kind of extent of remediation required here. Now I should uh, mention the environmental challenges at this point. Um, every project, every big project nowadays is required to have a code of construction practice. Um, this lays down everything from community liaison, liaison uh, hours of working, control of pollutants, including dust, uh, waste, ecology, importantly, um, all sorts of uh, issues around site safety and lighting. Um, and uh, particularly in the ecological front, we had major challenges building this, this major piece of construction down through the beautiful Borders countryside. Uh, and here you see some temporary badger sets being installed. We had over a hundred badger sets to, um, to relocate and uh, all this has to be done with uh, permissions from Scottish Natural Heritage uh, and a lot, of, um, a lot of waiting to see how the badgers behave before we can actually go into uh, what, was, what was formerly their land. Another big challenge was uh, the River Gala itself. Um, it was a, a special area of conservation, um, as, well as, uh, as well as being a breeding ground for salmon. Um, it contains river lamprey, which are a protected species. Uh, and at this particular location, the, the river, probably about 20 years or so ago, uh, decided to split and one half of the river uh, moved over here and started eating away the railway embankment. 
Um, now, when we came to look at what we're going to do in this area, we thought we'd simply be able to cut off this diversion of the river, put it back into its main channel. Uh, but by this stage, um, this new section of river had developed its own um, its own habitats, its own river habitats. And so we're left with no option but to leave it and to rebuild and strengthen um, the side of the railway line. We're now at the halfway point in the railway. This is Falla Hill. And um, we had various challenges at Falla Hill because the A7 uh, crosses over the railway line um, and it's at the same area where you can actually see terribly well, but in the background there's um, quite a, a number of houses here in the community at Falla Hill. And there was a lot of different options as to um, how the how the bridge over the railway and the road works and the railway works were going to um, impact the Falla Hill area. That resulted in us owning quite a lot of land at Falla Hill and all this land contained good rock, which we were able to um, basically quarry uh, and use that for aggregates uh, that we needed on the railway. Now that had the added benefit that it then created space uh, for us to put all the stuff we couldn't use, all the stuff that wasn't suitable from an engineering point of view was placed in, this, in the void uh, and, and eventually landscaped. Um, one of the wags at Transport Scotland said they were changing the road signs uh, to read Falla rather than Falla Hill because we had removed all the hill. Uh, this is it later on in the process. The road bridge is starting to take place. We've got a temporary diversion here of the road. And um, this is the road in its final position over the bridge, uh, which is hidden in the snow. You can see the railway, uh, the rails are actually laid passing through here. This was the early part of 2015. Um, once the snow had melted, we finished this area here and landscaped it all. And uh, <clears throat> you wouldn't know that this whole area had been, had been excavated, indeed all, all this area. Uh, one of the funny things was uh, when we came to, um, finish this area off. We used hydro seeding to uh, plant grass seed and uh, it actually comes with a, a kind of green dye so that you can see the areas that you've sprayed it on. Uh, but there were stories in the local papers that uh, Network Rail had painted, uh, painted the grass green uh, for the Queen coming to open the line. As we move south down into the Valley of the Gala, um, we come across these bridges, hogback girder bridges, um, wrought iron bridges, the, not the original bridges in the line, a lot of the original under bridges were timber, uh, but these date from the 1870s, 1880s, um, and still in remarkably good condition. Uh, and what we did was we encapsulated them in uh, these uh, tents so we could blast off all the old lead-based paint taking care that the paint didn't fall into the, the river below. Um, and then uh, carrying out steelwork repairs, we did have to replace some cross girders, um, carry out some, uh, some, wrought iron, or some steelwork repairs to the wrought iron. And um, this was the kind of finished, um, finished product, uh, painted up uh, good for another 50 years or so. And uh, that's a comparison with, with how it was. Down to Beauchamp Tunnel. And uh, this is the south portal of Beauchamp Tunnel. And this isn't the original. This actually just dates from the 1950s. The tunnel was actually about 200 feet longer than this. And uh, Beauchamp suffered a, a number of problems over the years while the railway was in use. And it, it got to the stage in the 1950s um, where there was some uh, major distortion of the tunnel lining. And um, the, uh, the, the problem was that uh, the original tunnel had been uh, blasted out the rock um, or dug out the rock uh, and a lining installed, but lots of rock was falling down from the area above in the void down onto the tunnel lining. And um, over the years, uh, there was all sorts of bullhead rails. There was strapping. Um, inside the lining of the tunnel to, to support it. So in the 1950s, they went in and they put a, 
a, a new concrete saddle over the arch of the tunnel. Oops, uh, sorry about that. And uh, packed it with stone, grouted it up. Um, and so when we came to reinstate the tunnel, we weren't sure how much of this work had been done and how successful it had been. Now, luckily, uh, through taking cores and investigations, we found that actually they'd made quite a good job. <clears throat> we still had to do a, a lot of work in Beauchamp Tunnel, but it was traditional railway tunnel work, some spray concrete linings, uh, patch brickwork repairs, some, um, uh, some stitching uh, into, the, into the side of the tunnel in various places, and importantly, putting in this concrete slab track which not only strengthens the base of the tunnel, uh, but allows a, a lower track profile and allows us to get, uh, in future, it gave us clearance for overhead wires without any, any other major work in the tunnel. And this is one of our um, engineering trains coming out the, the south end of the tunnel. We then get come down to Torwood Lee Tunnel, uh, just north of Gala Shields. This is it in the top right hand uh, picture. But right next to Torwood Lee in the countryside um, was this uh, old bridge over the river. And in fact, there's another, um, the, the River Gala goes round in a loop and there's another demolished bridge in the other side of the tunnel as well. And um, this, was, th this was one of my biggest concerns was how we're gonna get in here with major construction plant to rebuild this bridge. Um, and in fact, we did manage to get the crane through the tunnel um, and all the materials, and we're able to get this new uh, bridge in place, actually using a lot of the um, original piers from, from the old bridge. But it's a fairly remote corner of the countryside uh, to work in. And so we come to Gala Shields itself, <coughs> uh, a Gala Shields being a built up area, almost all the railway land had been taken over and the bridges demolished or removed. Um, and uh, it really was a tight squeeze trying to thread the railway back through Gala Shields. The original station had been taken over by an ASDA car park and a, and a health centre uh, as well, uh, uh, part of it. Um, and so we were left with a very narrow corridor to push the railway uh, past the, the, the edge of ASDA. We weren't, we weren't rich enough to be able to buy uh, ASDA out. Um, this is one of the new bridges in Gala to replace one of the ones that was long gone. Uh, now you'll notice some of the earlier bridges in the line were painted green. Now those of you who know your borders rugby will know that green is the colours of Hoyt, foot, or Hoyt Rugby Football Club and there was no way that you were going to get green colours in Gala Shields. Um, so the bridges in Gala Shields are painted a nice colour of Gala Maroon. Uh, the only bridges in the line to be treated that way. And so let's have a look at the stations. Now all the seven stations were uh, built um, in skeleton form before the track was laid, uh, mostly using precast units. Um, once the track was down, we installed the copes and the surfacing just to make sure all the levels and the alignment of the platforms matched the track. The stations are unmanned, but they are fairly sophisticated in terms of um, IT, um, all have platform display screens that can show uh, where the trains are going to, the timings, how late they are. Um, there are automated announcements, automatic ticket machines. There's a long line public address help points and extensive uh, CCTV coverage. Uh, incredible number of CCTV cameras we've installed, not just in the platforms, but in the car parks so that people feel secure leaving their cars on these unmanned stations. And of course, we have electric car charging points, uh, a key plank of the Scottish government's uh, future transport policies to encourage electric vehicle use. So we did install electric car charging points uh, at all the stations. 
So moving on to the track laying, now there's various ways of laying railway track. Um, our contractor, Bam Nuttall, uh, have a Dutch arm um, and they do a lot of track work on the continent and they decided uh, to do it uh, the way they've often done it over there, uh, which is they bring in the ballast and the sleepers by road. Uh, the sleepers are then spread to the correct spacing using this very clever mechanical device. And then the rails are brought in in trains. Now we arranged the rails to be provided. BAM have this special device which pulls and pushes the rails off the train um, down onto the track and then pushes them forward along rollers. Uh, we had four of these trains, each train uh, holds 24 rails, that's enough for 1.3 kilometres of track and basically we laid 1.3 kilometres a day. So there was one train on site, there was another one being loaded at Scunthorpe and there was one train coming north and one train going south at any one time. So four trains in a circuit uh, to provide this ongoing supply of of rail to, to the Borders Railway. Uh, this is a close-up of the machine. This is the business end. Uh, but you can see here um, this device um, at the end of the rails just really lifts the end up. The, the real pushing and pulling is done by this machine here. Um, a lot of people are surprised how flexible uh, railway rails are. Um, but trust me, they're not flexible if you bang your head off them. So here we see another time-lapse uh, video showing the rails coming off. This is them coming off the wagon down onto the track. That's them being clipped up. And then the train will move forward to the next position. The next, next lot of rails come down. And so on. Now we did uh, all the track, all the track laying was done uh, during the winter of 2014-15. Uh, we did have some winter challenges, as you, as you can see here. Uh, once all the track was down, we uh, had to lay all the top ballast. These were brought in in our network rail hopper trains, um, and uh, oh, about 100,000 tons of ballast had to be installed uh, along the line. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, some of these trains were some of the longest, heaviest trains ever run in the, in the British Railway Network. Uh, because we had the railway, it was under construction, um, we could use these very long hopper trains to bring the ballast in. Uh, track, a variety of track machines to weld the rails to this as a tamping lining machine uh, to get the track in its final position. And then in February 2015, uh, Keith Brown, who was the Cabinet Secretary for Transport at that time, uh, came and we had a special event uh, at Tweed Bank to mark the final uh, rails being clipped up with uh, golden clips, which are still there, but they're just painted, so they're not actually worth anything. A word about the signalling in the line. This was the next big challenge. Um, all the kind of brains of the signalling are kept in these... Uh, uh, special um, containers uh, at each point where we have a, a, a double to single track connection. Um, all the signalling is using uses modern equipment. This is a modern LED signal, requires very little maintenance. And all the um, all the uh, uh, important stuff is 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 in that previous uh, slide I showed you of the. Uh, equipment building. Uh, these are all connected up using fiber optic cable and um, there are no, the only line side cables on this railway are these uh, buried fiber optic cables. So uh, you sometimes hear about disruption in the railways because of cable theft. Uh, well there are no copper cables to steal in this railway. Uh, the only stuff is fiber optics which isn't worth anything and it's buried anyway. So um, or, um, that, that was uh, one of, and it's one of the first um, uh, times that uh, fiber optics and uh, internet protocol systems have been used on the signaling system uh, of a major UK railway. Uh, last part of the signaling was the GSMR masts. 
uh, that stands for Global System Mobile for Railways. Uh, there are 14 masts along the route and uh, these all had to be installed to allow radio communication between uh, the signalmen and the train drivers. Then followed a, a period of testing uh, the railway until the railway was commissioned. That's when it became an official railway rather than a construction site in June 2015. Uh, this was the proving train we ran that day and ScotRail very kindly laid on their special uh, borders livery uh, passenger train uh, and we did final checks on all the platforms uh, and it was the first time a train had run at line speed uh, down, down the Borders Railway. There then followed a period of extensive driver training. Uh, ScotRail employed some new drivers based at uh, Gala Shields, uh, but also some of the existing drivers in the Edinburgh area had to, be, had to learn the, the route on this new railway. And so the railway opened on 6th of September. The official opening was actually on the 9th of September and we were very uh, honoured to have Her Majesty the Queen come along uh, and we took her down to Gala Shields, uh, hauled by John Cameron's beautiful A4 Pacific Union of South Africa. Um, and this is the Queen and the, the Duke of Edinburgh uh, with Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, unveiling the plaque at Tweed Bank. And it was the day that she became Britain's longest reigning monarch. So it really was a special occasion uh, with uh, worldwide coverage, uh, you know, pa partially because of, well, probably mainly because it was the day beca she became Britain's longest reigning monarch, but it meant the Borders Railway literally had uh, worldwide coverage. Now, I should say, just before I continue with this, um, I'm going to finish with just two very short clips. Uh, these were taken from the Queen's train uh, as it, uh, it travelled through Gala Shields. Um, we were actually in the coach behind and uh, it was a fabulous experience. There had been crowds come out, uh, camping, having picnics at various places along the line, uh, waving to the, the Queen's train as it went past. Uh, but what you see here is what the Queen saw as, she, as, as the train came through Gala Shields. Well, that concludes the presentation. I hope you enjoyed that retrospective uh, look back at the construction of the Borders Railway, and uh, I'll be delighted to take any questions. Tricia, over to you. We now have a grand total of nine questions that have come forward. So I think you will start with a fairly general one. We'll start with some general ones, move into the more technical ones, I think. And Steve had a question, does this railway have an unusually high number of bends? Um, yes, it does. Um, it, because, of the geo, because of the geography that it passes through, um, <clears throat> it's, um, it does a lot of twisting and turning to gain height, as I said, as I said earlier on. Uh, and then it basically follows the twists and turns of the River Gala. Um, so it, it does have, um, the, the vast majority of the railway is, is on curve, uh, as, as you would see from the, the, the video there. It's also got an inordinately large number of bridges and culverts. 
Um, again, because of the gradients and the the crisscrossing of, of rivers that it does. So uh, that's why there are so many bridges that had to be either built or refurbished uh, as part of the works. Right, another general question from Anne. What have the passenger numbers been like compared to the predicted numbers? Um, I have to say I'm not an expert on that, but it has been uh, hugely successful when you put it against what the projected numbers were. Um, the original the original projections for the railway uh, were in the region of uh, it was six hundred thousand or seven hundred and fifty thousand passengers per year uh, for the first year or so. In actual fact, in the first year there was well over a million, uh, and indeed uh, it, it was close to the million and a half. One of the interesting things uh, is that the original work that was done in the usage of the line suggested that most of the patronage would come from the north end of the railway um, in the kind of Gore Bridge, <coughs> S-Bank, um, uh, Dalkeith area, where there's a big population who travel into Edinburgh every day. Um, <coughs> not so many people using it over the whole length of the line. In actual fact, it's the reverse has been the case. It's had a much heavier usage um, from the south end of the line, which is good for, for the railway because we built it all the way down uh, to, to Tweedbank. The, the car park at Tweedbank is full and overflowing every, every day um, from the early days of the railway opening. So it really has been well used from the south end. Um, Less so, some of the stations at the north end haven't quite, uh, still done very, very well, but not as well as the ones at the south end. Um, partly that's, it's been a, a victim of its own success. A lot of the trains were so busy with <coughs> people traveling from the south that they were full by the time they got to the north end. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the other thing is that uh, <coughs> the railway still has a lot of competition. Uh, from Lothian buses who do a very good service from the Gore Bridge area um, into Edinburgh. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is the railway has been hugely successful um, in, in terms of passenger numbers, but also in terms of uh, the identifiable benefits it's brought to the borders. Um, a lot of the uh, tourist and hospitality uh, industries all reported a sizable increase in the year after the railway opened, uh, including uh, things like Abbotsford House, the, the home of Sir Walter Scott, a major tourist drawing the borders. A lot of the pubs and restaurants in Gala Shields even uh, noted a major increase in business. Now, of course, all that's been turned on its head recently with uh, with the current crisis. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, eventually we'll get back to where we were. Um, but certainly up, up to the point of uh, COVID coming along, um, the, railway, the railway had been hugely successful. Thank you. Now we have another question with two great minds thinking alike. Both Steve and David have asked if there are any plans or thoughts of extending the railway south of Tweed Bank, perhaps as far as Calais. Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the campaign group campaign for Borders Rail have always actively uh, campaigned for the whole railway to be reinstated. Um, the Scottish government position was, well, let's see how the new railway does before we consider extending it. Um, because of the success in the first few years, there has um, actually been some work done looking at uh, would it be worthwhile extending the railway. Now, that's at the stage where um, some detailed feasibilities are being organised. Uh, I don't know where that's got to at the moment, but that is the next stage to do some uh, in-depth feasibility to look at uh, how, what would be the best way of, of taking the railway further. Um, personally, I could see it going to Hoyk. Um, Beyond Hoyt to Carlisle, 
is probably a bigger ask. Uh, you know, if you really want to build a new railway down to Carlisle, uh, you really want it to be a high speed uh, mainline modern railway. And the Waverley line as it was, was, was always a challenge to operate. It always had a lot of uh, difficult curves and, uh, and gradients. So I, I suspect going all the way to Carlisle might not happen, but I could see it going to Hoyk, but I stress that's just my opinion. Uh -huh, thank you. And um, Gary wants to know whether, we, whether you had to pay the Duke of the Clue <laughs> to use his land, and if so, how much was the man paid? Well, all all the landowners, of course, were due compensation, and the compensation was uh, to agreed market rates. Uh, it was very tightly controlled uh, through the the criteria that was laid down in the Act of Parliament. So, no one should have lost out of it, but no one should have made a lot of money out of it either. Um, so yes, obviously the land that was compulsorily purchased, um, then, then the landowner would be compensated uh, for, for the loss of the value of that land. Um, in some cases, uh, if, it, if it affected their business, there would be, there would be further compensation. There, there was actually housing built along the railway line in various places. And those people had, were displaced from their houses and uh, they, they received uh, compensation for that, of course. Um, where the land is used temporarily, again, there's a, a, a kind of scale of compensation, but it's on a, a, a you know, a re much reduced level compared with compulsorily, permanently taking the land. Yeah. I, I can't tell you exactly what the numbers were because I, I don't actually know. There was literally um, hundreds of landowners involved um, throughout the borders line and uh, uh, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, right. I don't know what the, the overall numbers were and it wouldn't be right to talk about them in detail anyway. Thank you. I'm going to move on to some of the technical questions now. And um, we have one from uh, Geraint asking if you could elaborate on your comment about passive provision for electrification. How much work would be required to electrify the line? Well, the, <clears throat> the, the idea of passive provision is that um, we're not, we're not adding any costs, any specific items of equipment in for electrification at this stage, but anything we build uh, should not preclude electrification. And so importantly, um, all the bridge and tunnel clearances are such that you, you should be able to get the overhead wires uh, through these bridges when the railway is electrified without having to rebuild the bridge or, or lower the track again, which, which you often have to do, um, if certainly with tight, tight bridges over the railway. Um, the signalling equipment is another area where that is designed such that it's, um, it's immune to AC uh, electrification. So uh, minimal work would be required in the signalling side as well. Uh, very often when a railway is electrified, depending on the type of signalings installed, there can be quite a lot of work involved to immunise uh, the, uh, the track circuits or the signalling equipment against the, the effect of AC current. That shouldn't be required in the Borders Railway. Thank you. Um, we have another technical question from Tony, who I think is looking uh, for a Saturday night shift during some CWR stressing, he's asking, how does a fixed steel rail cope with thermal contraction and expansion with the ra rather large variation in temperature nowadays and perhaps more in future? I could let you answer that, Trish. <laughs> well, I, I can do that if you like. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, mo modern railway track is, is very, very heavy. We've got concrete sleepers 
which are a lot heavier than uh, than the old timber sleepers we used to have. And the fastenings that hold the rails to the concrete sleepers are very, very strong. Um, so, so basically the track is uh, largely held in place by its own weight. Uh, however, to, to assist that process, when we install the rails, we actually stretch them or stress them um, such that the, uh, most of the time in the Scottish winter, they're actually in, in tension. Uh, if you break the rail, it'll spring apart. Um, and they're designed to be in a stress-free situation at uh, 80 degree Fahrenheit. I think that's the right temperature, Trish, from what I remember. Um, and uh, in, in very hot days, yes, the rails do go into compression. Uh, but because of the weight of ballast, we've got a lot more ballast around the track as well. Heavy sleepers, good fastenings. Um, the track doesn't actually buckle at all. Something a little less technical, but of great interest. Um, Pat's asking if the badgers took up residence in their artificial sets. And I could go on to ask whether they're now back at home. Uh, yes, they did. And uh, some of them, I, I'm not sure, I think some of them decided to stay put. Uh, others decided to migrate, uh, as they do. Uh, they, they, find, they find their own homes again. The, the key thing was to provide them with a temporary home while we did the, the railway work. Uh, inevitably, some will find their way back into the, the railway embankments again as, as, as wild animals and create burrows again. Um, I mean, there's, there's, we've, we own quite a bit of extensive land around the railway, so there's, there's plenty of room for them. Um, but uh, it, it was a challenge because you can't just go in and, and build a, a, a temporary set and expect them to move. Uh, you have to go through a, a, a process with um, Scottish Environment Scotland uh, 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 over the and get licenses to deal with with all these protected species. So uh, and only at certain times of the year. So it is quite um, time-consuming and quite a challenging process because it does literally stop the work at times um, if if you suddenly you know come across um, one that uh, you hadn't expected to find. Thank you. We'll move back to a slightly more technical question. Um, Ronald's asking about the spread between single and double track and how was it determined, the various lengths of both? Uh, we, we basically, th there had been um, a basic track layout done at the uh, parliamentary stage during the early 2000s uh, as part of the feasibility study. Now we, we took that and we, we ran various, basically various computer models um, and you know inevitably there was a need to uh, to get the right economy between uh, between providing extensive facilities on the railway uh, and trying to ensure reliability of the railway as well. The railway was never going to be double track all the way. It was always going to have be a single track with loops. That was clear right from the beginning, uh, at, at the, even at the parliamentary stage. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult because in a single track railway, 30 miles long, um, if you get delays on the single line, it's going to have a knock-on effect. Uh, there's no getting away from that. But uh, the idea is to, to get the right balance. And we believe we got that with the location and the, the, the length of the loops. Uh, you would see uh, maybe in that um, speeded up video that every time there was a, a a passing loop. Uh, these are long loops, by the way. They're not. Uh, they're not just short. The idea is the trains pass each other at speed, uh, and every loop there was another train coming the other way. The t t t t for a half hourly uh, timetable, um, there is literally a train at every passing place uh, as you go down the line. Train gets to Tweedbank and it needs to turn uh, and come back north again. And again, it will meet a train at every passing place. So 
it's an intensively used uh, uh, bit of railway. Right. Now we have um, several more general questions coming in and Geraint's asking, are there other major rail projects that you could recommend, Hugh, for building elsewhere in Scotland? So this is your chance to build. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Of course, it would be nice to see the Borders Railway extended, first of all. Uh, as I said earlier, I think it could easily justify going forward to Hoyk and it would, it would give the, the people of Hoyk a lot more benefits uh, from the line. Uh, beyond that, um, some of us who have been retired, not particularly me uh, personally, but uh, we have... Um, helped with some of the work being done at the Leaving Mouth branch and you, uh, those of you who, who uh, watch government announcements over the past year or so will have seen um, that the government's given the go-ahead for the reopening of the line to Leaving um, from, from Thornton Junction wh which is really great because that's another fairly major uh, area of population it's a kind of deprived area uh, and it's ideal for the benefits a railway can bring in terms of connectivity, uh, spreading economic benefits uh, in, into that area. Um, the one that always bugs me, uh, living as I do in Perth, uh, was the direct line that used to go from Perth um, down to Edinburgh. Uh, there was a direct line from uh, that, that opened at the same time as the Fourth Bridge, interestingly enough, in 1890. Uh, they went up through Dunfermline, um, through Cowdenbeath, up through Kinross uh, to um, Bridge of Erne. And uh, it would have been a lot shorter than the railways uh, that take you from Perth to Edinburgh at the moment. Um, the line was actually scheduled for development in the late 1960s. It wasn't part of the beaching proposals, but um, it closed um, because the board in London didn't, uh, at that time, uh, wouldn't uh, provide the funds for investment in the line. A Scottish region of British Rail at that time, for whatever reason, took the hump and closed the line in January 1970, a year after the borders line the main line from Perth to Edinburgh, the main line from Perth to Edinburgh was closed by British Rail and all the trains were diverted round by, uh, uh, by Stirling at that time. Now, if you're a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist, two years after that, the M9 motorway, uh, M90 motorway was built on top of the old railway line. Um, there are those that say it was a deliberate sabotage uh, I don't think it was quite, didn't quite happen that way, but uh, uh, certainly um, it's a huge shame that uh, without demolishing the M90 motorway, I don't think we're going to see the direct uh, Perth to Edinburgh line, which would have made the service from Inverness to Edinburgh, Perth to Edinburgh, so much faster than it is today. Well, we can dream on. Um, we've got perhaps a bit of a safer question for you and it's about disabled access to the line and Alan's asking what provisions were made for accessibility and you suggest such as platform heights. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, all the stations um, have uh, good disabled access well, I say good disabled access. They all have, uh, let me think now, they've all got disabled ramps. Um, have we got lifts anywhere? I don't think we have. Um, uh, the single, obviously the single uh, line platforms are easier to arrange access to than the double line platforms where you have to go right over the railway. So, so first of all, um, access down onto the, the railway platforms is, um, uh, is a requirement. The railway actually had to meet the requirements of the uh, interoperability 
PRM, which stands for Persons of Reduced Mobility uh, Regulations. Now that's, a, that's an EU regulation. Um, however, uh, interestingly, when it comes to platforms, um, all platforms in the UK uh, still have to generally be built to the standard railway height, which is uh, 915 millimetres above rail level, uh, 610 uh, to the side of the track, and there's a maximum stepping distance into the into the train. Now, why aren't we providing uh, level access? Well, the truth is you can't really easily do that with the UK type of platform and train gauge. Places where that has been done, um, either on certain underground stations in London or um, on the, the line, the Heathrow Express line, where you've got dedicated rolling stock um, and there are special precautions. The train has to slowly come into the platform because one of the issues with uh, mainline trains is they've got a dynamic effect of rocking from side to side. Not every train stops at the station, so you have to allow clearance um, for fast trains going through the station and also for freight going through, going through the station. Now, although that's not a major issue in the borders, they have to be designed to meet, to meet these kind of requirements. So there are limitations in what you can do in terms of uh, getting a level access into the train. However, ScotRail um, uh, provide ramps uh, one of the notable features of the first few months of operation was the number of people in wheelchairs using the railway. Um, because if you didn't have a car, they couldn't have used the bus previously um, because they didn't have disabled compliant buses going up and down the A7. Uh, so people, people were using the railway in wheelchairs because they could uh, get access into the trains. Uh, there's a whole a thing going on just now about uh, a PRM compliant trains. Uh, there are still a few running around that are not compliant, but I think all the ones in the borders line are uh, PR, PRM compliant. Um, so it's not it's not a, a, a perfect answer, but uh, that, that's where we are at the, at the present time. Thank you. Now, we're getting down to the last two questions and we're looking to the future here. Um, HW is asking, is it a candidate for hydrogen powered electric trains? Not sure how much you know about them. Um, well, I, no, I'm not an expert on them, but generally speaking, the best way to power trains um, so that they don't use diesel fuel and don't have any emissions is to electrify them. That's the simplest way. Put the wire above the train, power the trains directly. It means they don't have to carry their own power generation plant. The only place, my understanding is the only place that perhaps hydrogen trains or battery trains are useful is in relatively short stretches of line or, or lines that can never justify being electrified because of the limited, um, the limited usage. But for a line like the borders, it should be a fairly straightforward job to electrify it. Uh, there's a lot of, um, a lot of government ministers like to talk about hydrogen powered trains because it's seen as something new and exciting. It really doesn't work very well because uh, hydrogen, doesn't have the energy density of diesel fuel, uh, and it just can't provide the same level of power as you get through a 25 kilovolt, kilovolt overhead wire. So, so you know that that's the future. The next stage, I think, for the borders rail, we would be to electrify it, um, and that would give added benefits in terms of acceleration, probably reduce journey times as well. Excellent job of answering that one, Hugh. Thank you. Now, you mentioned government ministers. Um, Geraint has asked, this is your final question. The Prime Minister has suggested a bridge to Ireland. Would you consider that to be at all feasible? 
you've, you've built the borders railway, how about across to Ireland? I know nothing whatsoever to do with that and I'm not qualified to comment on it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, is, there, is there not a big trench full of uh, Second World War munitions or something in the middle of the Irish Sea? Uh, I wouldn't have thought it was a terribly feasible idea, but who knows, stranger things have happened. Who knows indeed. Right, well Hugh, thanks ever so much for that talk and your excellent efforts at answering that range of questions. Pleasure, thank you.